We have an injury update on James Book Knight. How soon could he be back? And how does Steve Clifford manage the long-term and short-term goals when it comes to going small in the NBA? We'll talk about all that today on Locked on Hornets. You are Locked on Hornets, your daily Charlotte Hornets podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, in a minute, cuz. We live. We live. We live. <laughs> Locked On Hornet, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We are free and available anywhere you get your podcast. And that includes YouTube. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first de- a deposit match up to $100. There's Doug Branson, if you watch Hi. him on youtube you can find him on his sub stack every hornets box score.com i'm walker mail listen to me wfnz every weekday from 12 to 3. doug did you get robbed man the the background <laughs> looking a little slight what, do you mean? what are you what are you talking about <laughs> so for for the audible medium his background is showing zero hats on the hat rack no posters, no jerseys, no Shea Serrano. Listen to our show one time sign. Whoever robbed <laughs> him only left the hat rack and the basketball goal in the background. Those are the uh, only no. things they left. Uh, no, I, I was not robbed. Uh, this bet the buzz, man. I mean, we keep losing. I mean, bet the you yeah. gotta bet the buzz. Mm-hmm. We sing it with <laughs> tears now, and David does too because you, uh, not not you, I guess. We we have to be very clear. It was the duffel of doom. That allowed David to lose all of his money. Uh, yeah. So the choices the the choices were, you know, take money from charity uh, or sell all my stuff. And you know, it, it, it I thought a lot about it. it. It was a hard decision, but I decided to leave the money to charity and to sell all my stuff. You know, the I thought the big dub hat would bring back more. Uh, and I to, I even told the person this is lightly used. <laughs> <laughs> Remember how I much we used, used that two years? It, it was frequent two years ago. Last year, I mean, you probably wore that thing like three times. That was a bit we didn't expect. Oh, wait, they actually have to get big dubs in order for us to use it every once in a while. And that has not really happened. I mean, could we? Yeah, I mean, they already lost to Dallas. It would have been tough to wear it after the Indiana game. I mean, yeah, Atlanta maybe in the opener. I don't know. It would have been tough to wear. But we're we're gonna turn things around. Bet the buzz. We're gonna turn things around. Uh, we've had a tough. We've had a couple of bad beats. I mean, you look at it, how we've done this, and I and I think we've bet on the Hornets when it made sense to bet on the Hornets. Uh, the Hornets just have not obliged, but we are going to turn things around. I promise you. I don't know about David. David lost. <laughs> he got that. He got that LaFrance ball. LaFrance, however you want to say it. Uh, but it, it cost him all his money. So we but need we're going to turn things around. We need Rod and we need Chad GPT. Those are the only people and non-people that have been able to win at Bet the Buzz. All joking aside, uh, the reason my uh, my background is a little bit more barren is because I am moving locations uh, starting next week. I will be in a new location for the show, getting some office space uh, in Nashville, giving uh, producer Katie her own office space here at home. So exciting times for for Pod About It Productions and for the Lockdown Hornets podcast. We're going to have there our own you space go. again. I'll- yeah, and I don't think I promised this on the show. I did to Doug afterwards, but because we're having construction going on on the house, I thought I would have to move because you can hear it so much outside. I thought I would have to go back in front of the fish tank, in oh. front of the big, in front of the big fish tank now. I think we got to see it for like a couple of episodes when it was first put up. So, it's looking different, it's looking great. I'm excited to go with all the fish puns, Shark Williams, Gobi Zeller, I'm ready for all of it. Fish Lamello Smith. Troll, I'm ready. Yeah, Fish Smith. I mean, it's just so easy. <laughs> it's right, <that's> right there. <laughs> it's right there. Fish Smith. I'm ready for all of it. So we'll see if that actually happens. If I set up, try to get away from the construction noise. We'll see how it all happens. Let's get into some Charlotte Hornets news. James Booknight news, actually, Doug. Charlotte Hornets wow. PR staff tweeted out yesterday that James Booknight underwent surgery on October 11th on his left knee mm-hmm. following his four-week reevaluation. He's been cleared to return to team activity Whoa. and further updates on return to play status will be provided as appropriate. He's listed as out though at Washington tonight. So won't play tonight, but is cleared for activity 
And we kind of got an inkling of this, Doug. It wasn't reported, but we saw James Booknight, I believe, in shoot around. And there wasn't any update on what book night was allowed to do what he wasn't allowed to do we just saw him we visibly saw him there shooting and starting to be involved in basketball activities what does this mean for james book night what does it mean for the charlotte hornets well as we know seeing anyone shoot uh, around doesn't mean anything in terms of uh, practice because we've seen cody martin do it a few times and his status is still very much um, in question for the remainder of the season uh, but this is uh, good news for Book Night. Uh, really, I mean, the timing couldn't be more perfect, Walker, because Rose, I know he's out on Friday, but I, I don't think Rozier is going to be back for another couple of games. So if, you know, if, if Book Night is day to day and he can come back sometime next week, Rozier will be out. They've tried Bryce McGowan's and Ish Smith. That hasn't been able to produce enough offense off the bench to even beat the Washington Wizards. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised at this point if Clifford decides to give book night an opportunity. Hey, go handle the ball. Let's see what improvements you made over the summer. It can't get any worse. Book night's got an opportunity to show something. I've watched the Carolina Panthers too much to say it can't get any worse. So I'm not going to delve in that territory. What I will say is you're right. It is the perfect situation for James book night coming back because they are depleted in the backcourt. And I'm not getting any uh, notion that Terry Rozier is going to play in the next couple of games. They said at least out for two games, but we'll see if Terry Rozier comes back after the next. Uh, I guess he's going to miss one, right? He, they said he was going to be out. Washington's the first one. He'll miss this other game against Washington. And then we'll see how soon he can come back. But it is the best thing for book night, at least with the way that the roster is constructed now. And you're right, Doug. They need scoring. And that is the idea of what James Booknight can do. The, the, the idea of Booknight when you draft him is that he can get to the rack. He was good at scoring at the rim in college. That was the thing that was his saving grace. Man, this guy can get to the cup, and then he can finish once he's there. The three-point shooting was a little spotty. Mid-range wasn't really there either, but he can get to the cup. That has not necessarily worked out in the NBA, but has he learned enough over the offseason? It was a rough summer league. But, I mean, the guy, it, I think he's going to get another chance. I think so, Doug. It's it's not a foregone conclusion. But if he's not going to get it in this situation where they are so depleted in the backcourt, then it's done for Book Knight. Like, officially, officially done for Book Knight if he doesn't get a chance now. Well, I hope he does because, uh, yeah. you know, they decline the option. So you feel like whatever version of Book Knight you're going to get, you're going to get a version of Book Knight that is playing for his – NBA career and I think that could only benefit the Hornets and benefit book nine if he can play well so uh yeah I I think they should give him an opportunity because it would it would offer some of these bench units a little bit more offensive dynamism I mean you, the Hornets lost that Wizards game in the second quarter and they got outscored in that second quarter 41 to 17 now, I don't know that Book Knight's really going to do anything to prevent the Washington Wizards from scoring 41 points, but I'm pretty sure he could help the Hornets score more than 17 in a quarter, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's it, they, they are struggling to keep these good offensive teams from scoring 40 in a quarter, but if they can score along with them, I mean, that's how they won games two years ago. They, they didn't, they weren't like the best defensive team. They just outscored everyone. And so... Uh, you know, I think Book Knight, if he has improved his defense just a little bit over the offseason, should note that, that he actually had an offseason, right? I mean, this injury that he got to the knee happened after he did put the work in over the summer. So let's just see what that work uh, means for his game. Was it defense? Was it ball handling? I mean, the Hornets need a little bit of everything on the offensive end at this point. I just don't see why it would hurt um, to throw Book Knight out there and see what you get. Totally agree. This could be the time. All right, let's talk a little bit more about this game against Washington and the future coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. How does Steve Clifford balance long-term solutions and short-term solutions? Winning once you get to the playoffs, but also getting to the playoffs. We'll talk about that as it pertains to the Charlotte Hornets going small and getting killed by five out lineups. We'll get to that in a moment. Not before we talk about Jace Medical. This episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. And we spend a lot of time talking together. You and I, Doug and I, the listeners, we all spend a lot of time talking together. We get fired up together on wins and losses, who starts, who sits. I'm thankful for that connection we have. And today, 
I want our chat to be a little bit more personal. I just learned that you can get a one-year supply on ED medications, and you realize what that means. You can bring it on extended travel. You can bring the medication on the next natural disaster or supply chain issue. You're covered. You don't have to worry about whether or not you can refill your generics for Cialis or Viagra. And this is possible because of our friends at Jace Medical. Go online right now at jacemedical.com to receive your 12-month supply on your daily medication. Remember to use promo code Locked On at checkout, too, for a discount. A verified customer had this to say about Jace so you know it works. I'm thankful for the service. Supply chain issues caused me to cut pills and have to have it. I ordered most of my daily meds with a year supply. I also ordered an antibiotic kit. I feel secure now. Prices are lower than local pharmacies. I highly recommend this for everyone. Again, that was from a verified customer that had those comments about Jace Medical. If you were someone you love, would get some peace of mind by having a year supply of any daily med, go to jacemedical.com to see if it's offered for you. Remember to use promo code Locked On. Again, Locked On for $20 off of your purchase. More Locked On Hornets coming up. Doug, your background is so much sadder than it used to be. I mean, it's so different. And it's, and it's cool, too. That's the thing. A purple wall and a purple light is going to be better than just my old regular whatever the hell light. Just normal, la di da I got the Hornets bucket hat in the background. I got some basketball cards. It's still a cool background. I just missed the Shea Serrano sign and the Jamal Mashburn jersey staring right back at me. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, some of us aren't as uh, fortunate to be able to add a seventh bathroom, you know, to their palace, their palatial estates. Uh, so excuse me. Excuse me for doing what I can to to, to pay <laughs> pay our bet the bus. <laughs> you got to <laughs> bet the bus. <laughs> I'm not giving up my fish tank. I'm not doing it. I refuse. So I hope you have more jerseys <laughs> to give away because I absolutely refuse to give up the fish tank. Let's discuss the Charlotte Hornets. And how they get to shooting better, Doug? It seems like you've been asked that quite a bit on your subtext conversations you've been having with listeners. Hey, they're not shooting well. How do we start shooting well? And it's funny because <laughs> the simple answer is, well, I just got to knock down buckets. I, I don't know what to tell you. But are there any other ways that they can, that they can shoot better, Doug? Like what, what can Steve Clifford do? What can this team do to see the ball go in the hoop a little bit more from deep? Yeah, it seems like they're waiting on Miles Bridges' return to solve a lot of problems, but I don't know that it would necessarily solve the shooting problem because Miles wasn't shooting a great outside ball, you know, a year, year and a half ago, whenever the last time he played was. So I'm not sure that that immediately solves your outside shooting issues. The Hornets seem to be shifting strategies a little bit to deal with it in, in terms of like not taking three point shots. They're moving more of their offense both at the rim and then, you know, getting plays for Gordon Hayward and P.J. Washington to hit stuff in the short mid. So, I mean, that's that's a tact that they've taken. It didn't work against Washington. I don't know what you do because you're not going to turn Ish or Bryce or Thor into knockdown three-point shooters. That you, you, know, you made those decisions in the offseason. That, that's sort of that's set in stone. Now, you could explore some guys that are sitting out there right now. I mean, Danny Green, a lot of people have been clamoring to bring Green in. Uh, for for an opportunity, but then yeah. you got to clear a roster spot, and we just talked about Book Night being almost ready to return. Um, so, do you go out and spend money on a Danny Green, or do you say, well, let's see what we got in Book Night first? I think the the Hornets are going to see what they have in Book Night for sure before they go out and explore any other options. So, I don't know. I mean, trade for a shooter, but I mean, do you what do you give up? And if you can't even beat the Washington Wizards, are you going to give up a lot of stuff to go out and find a shooter? That seems like it's something that a, a team that was on the verge of competing would do not a team that, um, you know, seems to be on the precipice of, of being in the bottom three again. Well, yeah. And, and it, it's really going to hurt when Terry Rogier isn't out there, but he's not been shooting the ball. Well, from three point range, Gordon was before this game, PJ Washington had a bad three point game going zero of five, but he was at 40% still like little up and down PJ's inconsistencies have only been about shooting from deep. It has not been overall, except for this game against Washington, where we didn't see him shooting as much. But the three ball has not been there consistently for P.J., even though overall it it had been, if you look at the percentages. And yet the volume's not as up from deep, I don't think, from P.J., Doug. Like, we, we saw him shoot five this game. We saw him three a couple ago. 
LaMelo Ball, I mean, he's finally got his shot coming around after the fourth quarter of Dallas and this game against Washington. Is it just a matter of, hey, we, we do have four of the five starters when all healthy. They're guys that I feel comfortable enough watching shoot the basketball. Or is there a real problem that you think is going to continue as the season goes on? Well, I think you have to look at shot selection as well. Mm-hmm. There's a balance that that every coach has to strike between, you know, when, when we're installing the offense, how much of that offense is going to be set plays and how much of that offense is going to be dependent on your point guard to sort of decide, all right, this is going to be a quick transition player. This is going to be something where we settle down and get into something that we've that we've practiced before. And I think Clifford tends to be, even if you go back to the Kimba Walker days, Clifford tends to be the kind of coach that is more about relying on that point guard to set the tone of, of how the offense is going to be run. And there's going to be some set plays out of timeouts and out of, you know, out of the baseline, out of the sideline, but not a ton of set plays run otherwise. And so then it is up to LaMelo Ball to say, all right, I'm, I'm going to get a good shot here. And it's up to the rest of the players as well to move on offense. I mean, I think that's a, something that a lot of smart basketball people who pay attention to the Hornets have pointed out online is, I mean, there's a lot of like, just run a high pick and roll and everybody else stand in the corner. There's just not a lot of movement. This is not a, this is not the peak Golden State Warriors. It's, it's pretty much the opposite of that. So, you know, they, they've got some things to work out on offense. I don't think it's as simple as saying, well, guys just aren't knocking down shots. There is a little bit of that because I, the percentages on their wide open shots, not very good. You know, it's, it's not all your teams just throwing, uh, you know, defenses at the Hornets that the Hornets can't handle and are getting run off the line. No, they're missing open shots, but they're also taking mm-hmm. bad shots. And there's also not a lot of movement. It is a multi-level problem when you shoot the basketball this poorly. So... Yeah. How much would going small help them out? So because it, how much would it would it help just putting one more shooter on the floor, Doug? So Mark Williams comes out despite Steve Clifford's reluctance to do so. I mean, it's not even like Mark Williams played a ton of minutes in this game against Washington, but he played enough to provide an impact and maybe even negative impact. If you view the defensive rotations as a problem of going big while Washington goes small. So if you put PJ Washington at center, And then you have your starting power forward. Your starting front court looks like Brandon Miller, Gordon Hayward, P.J. Washington. And then you have backcourt as Terry Rozier, LaMelo. Defensively, rebounding, yeah, you might just get cooked. That's going to have to be a collective effort, especially rebounding with that not being P.J. strength. Brandon's good at it, but Gordon and Brandon, those are your, your guys crashing down low. You're thinking the centers are going to be able to hurt you unless you're able to hurt the opposition on the offensive end. You know, PJ played 50 po- uh, 54% of his minutes two years ago at center, according mm-hmm. to cleaning the glass. Mm-hmm. And I thought that's when the Hornets played some of their better basketball. That was what the 43 win season that they had a couple of years back. And then they go down because of all the injuries and that's Steve Clifford, you know, coming in. So is that an answer to Steve Clifford's comments about, us getting killed going when teams go five out, even if they want to kind of go through these trials and tribulations with Mark Williams at the five, trying to put it like it, you put it well before we started recording. It feels like Steve Clifford is trying to figure out long-term solution compared to short-term solution and which one matters more right now. Yeah. I mean, the long-term solution is that you have a center that can both defend the rim and allow you to deal with some of these five out lineups for some period of time before you do eventually have to go small. I mean, I think Clifford views that as like, that's how we ultimately win in the playoffs. And so let's try to figure that out, you know, at the beginning of the regular season and improve over time. The problem is it's costing them games that they should absolutely be able to win against teams like the Brooklyn Nets, who were who are a better team on paper, but were missing their starting center and starting power forward. That's a game you should have won uh, against Washington. Absolutely a game you should have won against one of the worst teams in the NBA. And I will I will point out several comments that I got on subtext and on every Hornets box score and on the YouTube was like, OK, if you keep getting beat by the worst teams in the NBA, that just means you're the worst team in the NBA. Is, I know. I know. This is a fair I, point. I went on, totally a fair I went point. on an epic rant on WFNZ yesterday. Like we do this thing going to the foul line when you're just ready. You you have the technical foul. You're going to the uh-huh. foul line. 
And I, I kept saying to the Wizards, right? I kept integrating that back into the, the rant. And then it's like, wait, but people are saying this. It's the Hornets. It's the Horn- they, they feel the same way. There needs to be some self-awareness, and I recognize that. <laughs> right. And, but, and we, we also have to recognize this, that when you point out the stats two seasons ago and P.J. Washington at center and what that was able to do for that particular team – we we know one thing about Clifford and it's that he does the research like he knows. I mean, he's he's looked into this and, and I'm sure if you look back at those lineups that had PJ at five, they had Miles Bridges at four. You know, I mean, I think that's making the point for Clifford, which they is did. essentially You're like, right. yeah. you know, hey, I can't look. Yeah, maybe it would help guard Danilo Gallinari up top. Maybe there would be one or two less three pointers at the beginning of that second quarter. But if we left PJ at center for the entire second and third quarter, I mean, the Wizards already beat them in offensive rebounding in that game. They were getting crushed on the offensive boards in that game. Second chance points go through the roof, and then uh, you can't defend at the rim anymore. So guards are just going to penetrate. It's not going to be Danilo Gallinari going to kill you. It's going to be Shamit dunking even more than he did in in the game to begin with. So... The problems compound. And so I, I sympathize with what Clifford is looking at. And all I'm saying is, is there value in giving it a shot in making the quick adjustment and saying, all right, we're going to shut Danilo down for a few minutes mm-hmm. and then and then putting Mark or Nick back into the game? I, I just think there's a an unwillingness to to make some of these adjustments, even for a few minutes, to try to neutralize what the other team is doing. I feel like other teams are playing chess and we're playing checkers and, and and trying to play long-term chess. Well, and and back to your point before we move on to the last segment, defensively for sure, I mean, here you are mentioning Miles Bridges was the four in those lineups. You're absolutely right about that. And you might get beat at the rim where the guards are not afraid anymore because they're afraid of Mark Williams blocking their shot when he's there. Now, when they yeah. stretch him out, there's room to operate, and we've seen that in the small lineups. But when he's there... They think twice about it. They don't as much with P.J. This is where P.J. Washington's shot blocking comes into effect, though. We've discussed quite a bit about his block percentage, how good he's been at his size when he's down there, a small ball center. And so that would help. But, Doug, this year, if you'll notice, P.J.'s doing a lot of the hands-up thing. It doesn't seem like he had a nice, I think, transition block that was awesome. They got the offensive rebound and, and put it back up. He's doing it. Yes. Uh, put it on. Yeah, I had to go to the, to go to the full balance. shot. Let's get a shot of yes. those pits. Let's see those Ooh, pits. Look, goodness gracious. Yeah. He's going straight up. Right. And he's not fouling. And you have to wonder if that's coached because if PJ Washington fouls, then where the hell else are we going to go defensively outside of Brandon Miller? Who's also getting in some foul trouble as a rookie. It's understood, but it doesn't seem like he's challenging as much, not being as aggressive. And it goes back to what my dad told me when I was playing basketball and it was all about talking about it was we were discussing defense. It was like, all right, if your coach tells you, hey, don't pick up the foul, just go straight up and play good, solid found defense. You say, OK, coach. And then you continue to go after the block and play <laughs> aggressively because that's how winning defensive plays are made. I understand both. I think P.J. Kyle Kuzma hit some tough shots, man, and like a mm-hmm. lot of them. He, he mm-hmm. was really good against P.J., but P.J. did the arms up thing. And I, I don't know what else you do on some of those Kuzma shots. But do you feel like he's not challenging as much as maybe he used to, part because Mark is in there? That's that's a big difference, but also because he seems to be playing straight-up defense? I I think there's some of that. I think uh, you touched on it, which is that he's so vital to the offense right now. They they need his two-point scoring because the three-point shooting isn't there. That I'm sure it's like, hey, PJ, if you get into foul trouble, we are absolutely bleeped. So please don't get into foul trouble. And... Uh, PJ recognizes that, I think, and is acting accordingly. But yeah, I mean, PJ was a guy in years past that they could depend on to go out there and defend Giannis Antetokounmpo and get physical with him, to defend Jimmy Butler. It's not as if that is not in PJ's wheelhouse. So to to not see it is something that stands out. And I think you, you the question you go is like, why is that happening? I don't think it's because PJ is not trying. I think I think there is some element of him being told, um, to do that. But back to the Clifford thing really quickly. I think it's surprising that we're not seeing the short-term thinking from Clifford because it's not as if he's on, you know, a five-year deal, right? I mean, this is for, for both Mitch Kupchak and Clifford, it's it's pretty obvious that this is a 
one year trial. Let's see how everything works. And the, the new ownership group is going to evaluate all of that and make decisions. And so I honestly, I think you, whether you agree or disagree with Steve Clifford, you kind of have to respect that the, the fact that he's like, look, I got principles. I've got th- these things I know yes. uh, win in the playoffs and I'm going to do them regardless of whether it costs me my job or not. I'm just going to do them because I think they're right. He cannot, he cannot be moved off of his post. The, the problem with that is, you know, they lose by 20 to the Washington Wizards. Because because he will not move Mark Williams off the post. That's what's going on. Right. And when you, <laughs> it's, it is a man that stands on print. It's exactly what I was thinking of. Man, he stands on principles. And I'm telling you, this is what he has been commenting on constantly. We need to be ready once we get to the postseason. So the problem with that is all of the lessons that come with learning how to play in the postseason means you don't get to play in the postseason. And that's the problem. We'll see if he fixes it. Well, you, and, you and the, well, more? ultimately, do I need to keep going? Well, ultimately, the problem is, and this has been the problem for Steve Clifford's entire tenure as head coach, both tenures as head coach of the Charlotte Hornets. He comes from teams and backgrounds that had star level talent across the board. Teams that you go, yeah. This team's going to make the play. They could they could fall asleep for half the season mm-hmm. and make the playoffs. So what our challenge is is to get this roster ready to go win a championship. And I think he's taken all of that with him to Charlotte. And twice now he has not been given the ingredients by the front office. Two different front offices have not given him the ingredients to actually go and execute. And he has been unwilling or unable to adjust to that fact that idea all right i want to talk a little bit more about this i also want to get to nick smith jr coming up next on the lockdown hornets podcast don't go to sleep on the hornets just yet how much are the past experiences of the charlotte hornets also you know uh hindering what steve clifford might do or affecting what clifford might do we'll get to that in a moment and discuss nick smith jr's five minutes that he got in garbage time five the good minutes oh yeah baby nick smith jr i want more <laughs> We'll talk about it in just a moment. Let's get to uh, Prize Picks, though. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. It's the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. With the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections. I love this um, uh, this factor that they bring in. Combo projections include football and basketball, different sports. You can go to the specials league, a league created specifically for those combo projections. That includes two or more players from different sports or leagues. For example, LeBron James, Travis Kelsey at a 10 and a half combo of three pointers made and receptions. I gave you an Adam Thielen combo possibly with the Hornet. It's we are in scary, scary, scary Panthers land right now. Do not pick more than on an offensive player for the Carolina Panthers. Do not do that. Just stick. I would I would highly advise against doing the specials league with <laughs> or, the Carolina or, Panthers. Or or do what a, I think a lot of people are doing with us right now is fading um, our selections. If we make a selection on this show, it's uh, yep. we're now going to advise you do the opposite. <laughs> That's correct. So come by for some advice on what to do in prize picks. And they even offer a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play, even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. Awesome stuff from Prize Picks. So go to prizepicks.com and use promo code LOCKEDONNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and then use code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. One more segment to go locked on one. Doug, I wanted to end that conversation we were having in, in the second segment because here, here's Steve Clifford. You're so right. It, he has been on quite a few teams in the regular season that we're going to get to the postseason, And even, you know, to Steve Clifford's credit, the Hornets got there in 2015-16. It's a while ago now. I mean, we need to see it more, but he got there in 2015-16. We see it with the Orlando Magic. We saw him do it again with the Magic in his mm-hmm. second stint with the franchise. The guy can, can game plan for a series. Like, he knows the other team's weakness. 
he knows once you get there, it's it's funny because once he passes that threshold, he's a scary coach. I mean, the fact that you got a game on the Toronto Raptors champion with Deep Augustine as your point guard, that's impressive. Uh, you know, going against Dwayne Wade with the Charlotte Hornets team, going to a seven game series, that's impressive. It's the regular season stuff where he is so ingrained in the rhythm of the guys, rolling with what rotation he wants to go with and allowing them to figure it out and standing by the defensive principles that matter a ton in the postseason because for so long, if you look at defensive statistics, teams that are strong defensively, those are the teams that get there further in the postseason more often than not. He knows all of that. What I wonder is, Borrego got his team to the play-in tournament a couple times, and then they got destroyed right. twice. <laughs> and so, is Steve Clifford one of those guys that does not want that to happen, and he's willing to not even get to the play-in? I know this is not exactly how he's thinking about it, but... In his mind, maybe it's like, hey, if we're going to get to the play-in and just get bounced by 30, then I don't want to get there. Like, I, it, It's not what he would explicitly say. I but I wonder if it. that's just <laughs> – yeah, I just – no, I don't want to get to the play-in. If we're going to get bounced by 30, if we're not going to be ready to do it, then how much good can be squeezed out of this? Because so far, Doug, you can make the argument that it's been more pain that has been squeezed out of it, getting the play-in and then getting bounced by 30. I don't want another one of those. I, I don't I don't want that to happen again. And so I, I wonder how much the previous experiences, the last two years under Borrego, which got him fired. The play in results got Borrego fired. Mm -hmm. How much has that affected Steve Clifford already also being the guy who he is? That I think that's a conversation that's interesting to me with his makeup. No, oh, for sure. I mean, I think both coach and front office has operated with this idea of building sustainable success, that there's no point in getting to the playoffs if you can't A win in the playoffs and B you know, actually get back there the next year. There's no point in, in doing what they did in 2015, 16, which is they built a team that got to the playoffs. And, and you know, Steve Clifford did a lot of great scouting in that series. Uh, if you remember, like those first two games were ugly. Miami, Eric Spolstra had the Hornets number. They shut Kimball Walker down. And Clifford was able to make some adjustments, including with Big Al Jefferson, that allowed them to get back into that series. He just couldn't he couldn't game plan against Purple Shirt Guy. And he couldn't game plan against Dwayne Wade hitting threes like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was Steph right. Curry all of a sudden. So uh, couldn't game plan against that. But they don't want to get there. But the problem, of course, is what we're talking about is like it's a chicken or the egg issue. You know, if if in the process of building sustainable success – you can't even have you can't even start being successful then then you failed and, and that and that's where i think that the problem is look clifford's teams traditionally they start poor and they make like big like the, all the playoff teams including if you go back to the bobcats team you look at the records you yeah. go wow through january this team looked dead in the water and then all of a sudden the improvements that clifford was trying to install you know, in those dog days of winter suddenly started to spring forward as they got late into the season and then they get into the playoffs. So this is not unusual. It's just the difference here is that Clifford's not on year one of four. He's on year, he's, this is it. You know, this is his opportunity and I just don't think it's working. Yeah, I remember we we found during the off season that the year they went to the playoffs and they struggled, P.J. Washington started like, or P.J. Hairston, excuse me, started like 40 games their playoff year and we were shocked by that that is not something that we remembered so yeah interesting facts that we found out this past off season and, and here's an idea for the new owners if 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 Rick if uh you know Gabe Plotkin and and Rich Schnall Rick Schnall Rick Rick Rich Schnall, Rick Schnall. uh if Rich they're Schnall. listening <laughs> If they're listening to this person who has a blank wall because he's he's sold all of his gear to pay off bet the buzz debts. If they're listening, here's what I would suggest. A little bit of creativity all around. A a front office, a general manager that is creative and uses all the tools necessary to go out and and build a winning roster that can win now and then you worry about how to win later later. Quit trying to play 4D chess when you can't even win a game of checkers, right? And then find a coach who is willing to get a little bit creative with the tools that he has been given. That's what I would suggest for the future, whether that future is 
uh, the, you know, the next season or the season after, whatever their whatever the plans are for the new ownership group, I would suggest finding people that have a creative, big vision for this team, and they go and try to execute it immediately. And and, and new owners give them the leeway, the tools, the money necessary to go and build that product. Do you think Nick Smith Jr. is one of those tools after watching him in five minutes of garbage time against the Wizards? What do you make of his outing? Could be, man. He's smooth with it offensively. That's my take on Nick Smith Jr. Smooth with it when he's got the ball in his hands and he's prepared to shoot. I mean, the the first bucket that he hit, that little mid-range off the spin move, I mean, like, that's, that's talent, man. I mean, to get open mm-hmm. in the NBA like that right off the jump, like, there's something there. Here's the problem. Remember when he had that transition pass opportunity and like had a guy way open. I mean, not an easy pass, but he attempted it and it was way off. And it's it was a Carlton half court shot. It was. Yeah, I mean, it was what I've been. It's what I've been saying the whole time with Nick Smith Jr. He cannot pass on an NBA level yet. I think he will be able to. It's just the thing that he's got to learn. Um, you know, and I think he's going to do most of that learning in Greensboro, but I can be super excited about what Nick Smith Jr. can become and also be honest about what he is right now. Well, yeah, and maybe not even Greensboro. Here we are talking about the opportunity for James Booknight. Oh, Here he well, is yeah. battling with Nick Smith Jr. And James Booknight did not win that battle in Summer League, Doug. I this is 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 nope. it gonna change? in the regular season, but both guys have opportunities that the very, very big difference is this is the first chance for Nick Smith jr. This is really the last one for James book night and book book night's not an elite passer, but he's, he's, he's better than Nick Smith jr. Right now. I mean, mm-hmm. there's just, and yep. he's got more experience. He knows like, Oh, that defender's going to move there at this point, And I can't, I can't fit it through that window. And he just, you know, he's not, again, I, I'm not saying that book night is like point guard level passer, but he's, Better than Nick Smith Jr. Last point here, though, offensively, I I think Nick Smith Jr. has shown you mid range. I mean, he's leaps and bounds better than James Booknight. I that's that's just not a part of Booknight's game. And so, as we've seen with Brandon Miller a little bit, you can use the mid range to buy you time to figure it out on the efficient spots on the floor. And Nick Smith Jr. did that immediately. He did that in summer league. And he even hit a three in this game, a deep one too. And so, and we know that Nick has that ability. The small sample size at Arkansas didn't really help him out, but Book Knight shot the three quite a bit last year when he got that those last you know few opportunities to get some run. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it, we know that Book Knight has not been good at attacking in the NBA, and that's what you drafted him for. So the I- mid range. It's working for our rookies here, Doug. Yeah, I think you lean into it at this point. You go out there and you find a way to trade for DeMar DeRozan, and he's going to be available because <laughs> the Bulls are also they're you know they're yep. struggling too. So you go out and you find a way to get DeMar DeRozan. You z- you zig while everyone else is zagging. You say three point revolution, bleep that. We're going to shoot as many two point shots as possible. Be some mid range mavens. Go out and get DeMar DeRozan. Play Nick Smith Jr. big minutes. Play Brandon Miller big minutes. No, no more threes. It's all mid-range, baby. The dream of the 90s is alive in Charlotte. And, and the hive. And the hive. Alive in the hive almost in Charlotte. That would be sweet, too. Um, in-season tournament tonight. Going to be a sweet court for Washington. Charlotte Hornets in-season tournament. The debut. We'll see how they're going to be able to play when the stakes are turned up just a little bit more. Fresh off a beatdown by the very team they're playing tonight. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your pods. Have a great weekend. Make sure you check out Doug Substack, everyhornetsboxscore.com. You can listen to me on WFNZ one more day before the weekend. We'll be back with you on Monday as well, 12 to 3 p.m. On Monday, we'll recap what we see in the in-season tournament. Do they answer some of the questions that we have? And because of the loss to Washington, some of those questions that we had because of it. So we'll figure it out on Monday. Have a great weekend. And uh, yeah, we'll be back on the daily podcast. That is the Lockdown Podcast Network. 